What is going on everyone, my name is Kodamore and welcome back to the New Beginner Java Game Program Tutorial Series Episode 34. In this episode, we will work on a basic graphical inventory system as well as loading fonts and drawing text to the screen. Now that is a lot of stuff that we will be doing in this episode, so let's get to it. Of course, there are endless ways to create an inventory system, so in today's video, we will be building a basic system that displays the player's current inventory, as well as item stats such as the amount of items that a player owns, or item descriptions and crafting recipes. Now I'm assuming that most people will want a drag and drop style inventory, so I do have an episode on that planned in the future, but for now I just want this game to become playable. Firstly, I have a few upcoming episodes where we will be rearranging the game structure a little bit to make it a better programmatic system, but don't worry about that. Secondly, you will notice that I have finally changed the art style in the game. Most of the art is now from opengameart.org and is all under the CC0 license but I have provided links to the creators of this art in the rest folder in the game, which can be found on my website down below in the description. Now let's get programming. So today we have to alter our inventory class to be able to display and manage information about items that the player has, and we're also going to need to be able to draw text to the screen. Now the design for this inventory that I'm aiming for is a mini craft style inventory system to give you an idea of what we will be programming. First off, in the Assets class here, I am loading up a new image, so I'm storing a new image called Inventory Screen, a buffered image, and I'm just loading that image using the image loader that we have here, and that image is in the Textures folder in the Res folder, called InventoryScreen.png. It's just a basic template of an inventory screen. You can either use the one that I have here or create your very own. And after we load that image in, in the Inventory class here, in the render method, after we check if we should or should not be rendering the inventory, of course, I am just drawing that inventory screen image here at a hard-coded position and width and height. Now, it's really up to you how you want to draw your inventory background, but in my case, I know the size of my background image, so I'm just going to hard-code the position values and the width and height in variables here. But you can center this image or do whatever you like with it however you like. And those variables are just up here, hard-coded regular values that I figured out to center the image. And I also have a couple of values here that I will explain later on in this tutorial, don't worry about these just yet. So now if we go ahead and run the game, and we press the key to toggle the inventory state, which for me is the E key, the inventory screen appears, but there are obviously a couple of problems here, items can actually be rendered on top of this inventory screen, which is not the greatest thing in the world. So to solve this, we have to make sure everything is rendered before we render this inventory screen here. To do this, let's head on into the player class here, and we are just going to add another method in here. Uh, let's go down to the render method and put it near that. We're going to add another method, it'll be a public void post render is what we'll name it, and it's going to take a graphics G. It's going to act exactly like our regular render method. But instead, when we call this method, everything else will be drawn already. So we'll remove the inventory.render from the regular render method here, and we will instead put that in the post render method, just so that we separate it right here. Now in the entity manager here, after we render every single entity, we are just going to want to do the post render method of the player. And in the future, we may even have to add a post render method to all of the entities, but we won't worry about that right now. So we're going to call that post render method of the player after every other entity is rendered. That way, in effect, the inventory will be rendered after everything else and will appear on top of everything. So if we just run the game and test this, if we press the E key, now no items appear on top of the inventory. So that is a very good thing. Now in the item class here, just before we get started with everything, I am going to create a, uh, so we're going to go to source, getters and setters, I'm going to create a setter method for this picked up variable right here, just because that's going to be useful to have, especially for testing purposes. And also, we are going to create another create new method for an item, we're going to overload this method right here, so that means having the method with the same name, just we're going to take in one variable and that's going to be the count. And this is only going to be for testing and debugging purposes, I'll show you how to use this method in a little bit. But instead of taking an x and a y as parameter, we're going to take in count, and we won't need to set the position instead, we are going to do set picked up to true, and we are going to do i.set count to that count parameter that we passed in, and then return that item. So what this method will do if we only pass in one integer as the count, is it will generate an item instance, and it will not add it to the game world at all. What it'll do is it'll just set up all the variables to be already activated to add this item to an inventory. Now you would not use this method at all in your real game. 
this is only going to be used for testing purposes. So to use that in the inventory here, in the constructor, what we can do is just do add item. So we'll add an item to the inventory. We'll do item dot, let's say a rock item dot create new, and we'll add five rock items to the inventory. And we can do the same thing uh, with the wood items that I have, wood item, and we can add, say, three wood items to the inventory. This way, for testing purposes, we don't have to knock down a bunch of trees and rocks to get items into the inventory. Again, testing purposes only. Now before we can get to displaying the items in the inventory, we have to be able to draw text to the screen. So to do this, we need a way to load and store fonts. So under the graphics package here, we will create a new class. This is going to be called font loader, and it's going to act almost exactly like our image loader class. So we'll have a public static font load font here, and it'll take in the file path. And we're just going to return font.createFont. We're going to pass in font.true type font. That's the type of font that we will be loading, TTF fonts. And then a new file, and we'll pass through the path there. And then we're going to do dot derive font. We'll do font.plain. And then we'll pass in size, and size will actually be another parameter to this load font option here. So we'll go ahead and import everything. And this will have to be surrounded in a try catch statement. So e.print stack trace. And if this does fail, we're just going to want to exit uh, because our game won't be able to run without a font. And we'll have to return null if that does happen. So this looks almost exactly like the load image method in the image loader. What we're doing is we are just loading in a new font uh, using the path that we pass into this method. And then this dot derive font here. What that does is it kind of sets up that font to be a specific size that we passed in. And it's also saying that we want the plain style of that font. We don't want anything fancy with it. And true type font is just the type of fonts that we will be loading. So to actually use this load font, we will need a font file. So in the res folder under the fonts folder that I have created, I have a font called silk screen here. You can use this if you like. It was not made by me, but I do have the license for it here. It is a really cool font, or you can use any other true type font, TTF font that you would like. So to actually get that font in the game, in the assets class here, I'm just going to go ahead and create a public static font, and I'm going to name this font 28, and go ahead and import the font variable. Now you may want to load multiple of the same font just using a different size in case you need to have a font of a different size to use in your game. So I am naming this font 28 because if I go in the init method here, I'm going to set that equal to our uh, font loader dot load font, and I'm going to have to pass in the path here, which is going to be res fonts, and then the name of the font, which is silkscreen.ttf, and I'm passing in 28 as the size. So by naming it font 28, I know that, okay, this is my regular font that I will be using in the game, and it's going to be size 28. If I needed one that's a bigger size, I could do font 48 and just do the same thing, but add a 48 sized font instead. But for now, I just want the one font size. So that should successfully load in that font into our game. And in order to actually draw text to the screen, it takes a little bit of code to do that. So let's go ahead and under the graphics package, create another new class. I'm just going to call this text. And it's just going to contain one method for now, public static void draw string. So it'll draw some text to the screen. And it will take in a graphics G, of course, the text that we want to draw to the screen, an X position, a Y position, Boolean center. So whether or not we want to center the text on that position or just write it at that position, it'll take in a color for the font and then the actual font that we want to use to draw the text to the screen. So this is just a utility method that will help us draw text to the screen nice and easily every time. Firstly, we'll have to set the color of the graphics, so g.setColor, to the color parameter. Then we'll have to set the font that the graphics used, so g.setFont, and pass in the font parameter there. Then we'll create int x and set that equal to xpos, int y equal to ypos here. And then we'll be able to do g.drawString, the text that we want to draw, at the x and y position. Now, if we want this text to be centered, we are going to have to change around the actual x and y position to draw it at. Because by default, g.drawString here draws the text beginning at this point. So the lower left part of the text will be this point right here. But if we want to center the text around a certain point, we'll have to do a bit of extra code. We'll have to get something called a font metrics 
equal to g dot get font metrics of the font that we have. And this just provides us with all sorts of data about the font, the width of some of the characters, the height of all the characters, that way we can do some neat calculations with it. And we'll have to modify the x and y position that we will be drawing the text at to get it to center around the point instead of be drawn at that point. So we'll set x equal to the x position that we passed in minus fm dot uh, string width of text divided by 2. So our new x position will be the position that we passed in subtracted by the uh, pixel width of the string that we want to draw divided by 2. So we're essentially just moving our x position that we passed in back a little bit, that way it appears to be centered around this point. Now for y, it's going to be a little bit different. We'll have to do y position minus fm dot get height. So we'll get the height of most of the characters divided by 2. And then we also have to do plus fm dot get ascent. And ascent is more like a correction type value. It's actually the uh, amount of pixels that the font should be drawn above the baseline or above the line that you want to draw the text at. So this function now allows us to do a lot. We can either draw a text uncentered at a specific point, so the bottom left hand corner of that text is at this point, or if we pass in true to be centered, then the text will be centered around the point that we pass in instead, which can be very useful. So let's test this out. In the inventory screen here, let's draw some text. Now, this inventory list center x and y actually refers to this point right around here on my inventory. Because this right here is going to be a list of all the items here. So I just have the center point of that hard-coded into my game as well. So what we can do is, after we draw the inventory screen, we can do text.drawString, that method we just created, pass in g, any text that we'd like. Let's say uh, I'll do a little arrow thing, rock item, and then another arrow, so that it looks like it's selected. For x position, I'm going to pass in that uh, inventory list center x variable that I have, inventory list center y as well. You can use any values for this, of course. Yes, I do want the text to be centered, or actually, I'm going to pass in false to begin with. I want it to be the color white, and we'll pass in assets dot font 28, that font that we loaded in to begin with. So there is the line to hopefully draw some text to the screen. Import everything, run the game, and if we hit E, as you can see we have some text drawn, and the lower left hand corner of this text is at that point I mentioned, is at that center point. But if we change this variable to be true, if we want to center the text around that point instead, then it will look like this, the center of the text is at that point now instead. And now you can see why that is very useful. So this is great. Now we have a way to actually draw text to the screen, which will make having an inventory, of course, much, much easier. So let's get on to that inventory stuff now. First, let me show you exactly what we will be programming here. This is what we are going to be aiming for, a list that we can scroll through using the keys on the keyboard here. Of course, the selected item is in the center here, highlighted yellow, and it just displays the image and the amount of that item that we owned of this selected item here and we can scroll up and down this list nice and easily. Now let's get a few values that we're gonna need first of all. We already have inventory list center x and y. Those variables are the center position of what this selected item is going to be right here. That's very important to have because we're gonna be doing a little bit of weird math in a few minutes. So it's important that we have the center position of that selected item there. And if your inventory is going to be styled a little bit differently, you'll just have to change around the math that I do to make it work correctly. And I also know that each one of these list items should be spaced 30 pixels apart vertically, so I'm just going to go ahead and create a variable for that in my game. Inventory list spacing, set that equal to 30, of course it might be different for you. Spacing. And also before we start, let me just create some variables for the position, for the coordinates of the image that I'm going to need up here in the upper right, as well as the coordinates for the amount of the items owned in this little box here. Again, it's probably going to be different for you, but we want to have those values ready to go anyways, so let me just create those real quick. So I just created those variables here. Here is the x, y width and height for that image I'm going to have, and here is the coordinate for the count that will be displayed. You can wait until we're actually coding this to actually figure out these values. Don't worry about it right now. Also, we need some way to actually tell what item is currently selected by the player, so we'll have another private int called selected item, and we'll set that equal to zero to begin with. This is just going to be the index of our inventory items array list right up here, so the index of the currently selected item that we have. Okay, now let's head on down to the render method right here. We'll take out this test rendering text piece. 
And we are going to need, first of all, the length of our inventory items array list here. So we'll just set a variable equal to the size of that list. And if this length equals zero, if we don't have any items in the inventory, then we just want to return from this method because we have no items to actually render in our inventory. If that isn't the case, however, we actually have to start displaying the list of items. So I'm going to write out the code and then I'll actually explain it more in depth after we're finished writing the code. So we're going to have a for loop going from negative five until i is less than six and we'll have i increment every single time. And if our selected item index plus i is less than zero or our selected item index plus i is greater than or equal to the length of our inventory items, we're just going to continue on with the for loop. We're going to skip the code once and continue with the for loop. Okay, so why do I have these random values in here? Well, if we take a look here, I have my selected item being this center point here, but I have five extra slots above that that I can display items in, as well as five slots below that. So because we're going to base all of our math off of this center item, the selected item, we have to start our loop at negative five because our list is going to begin five items above that, and we're going to go until we're less than six, or essentially until i is equal to five, which is five slots above that selected item there. That's why I have those values in the for loop. Now, of course, there might be a point on our list where we don't have to fill up every single item slot. There might be a few empty slots above or below the selected item. And that happens if our selected item that we are trying to display in the center, plus whatever item that we're trying to work on in this for loop, is out of bounds of the actual inventory, and we don't actually have an item at that index. So we have to check those bounds, and if it is less than zero or greater than the length of our inventory, we just have to skip that item and continue with the for loop. Now we can actually render that item's name to the list that we are trying to create. So we'll do text.drawString, pass in g. The text component will of course be our inventory items. Dot get, we'll have to get the selected item index plus i, whatever item in the list we're working on. Dot get name, because we want to display the name of the item. Exposition will be our inventory list center x. And I'll just bring this down here. Our y position will be inventory list center y. But we also have to add i multiplied by the inventory list spacing variable that we created. So if i equals 0, we're going to be on that center point. We're on the selected item. So this really won't do anything. But if we are below or above that selected item position on the list, we just have to tweak the vertical position by that list spacing variable multiplied by whatever amount of spaces away we are, which is that i value. Yes, I do want this text to be centered, and we will just make it the color white just for now. And we'll pass in the font that we need, font 28 in my case. So if we run the game now, we have my two test items in the list, and the item at position 0 is in that list there, and we're getting no errors, so that's very good. Now before we continue on, we're going to need a way to actually move this list around a little bit. So let's go on up to the tick method, and after we check if everything should be active or not, let's create a way to actually get this list to move around by the keyboard. So we'll do if handler.getKeyManager.key just pressed, key event vk underscore w, so if they press the w key, I want to move the list down a little bit, so we'll do selected item minus minus. We'll subtract one from that selected item value. And I'll copy this down, and if they press the S key instead, then we will add one to that selected item index. Now this won't work, this will actually create very many errors, so we have to check if the selected item is still greater than zero and less than the length of our inventory items list. So if selected item is less than zero, then we want to set the selected item to the opposite end of the list, and we'll just loop around the list. So we'll set that equal to inventory, oops, inventory items dot size minus one, of course, because it is essentially an array. Else if selected item is greater than or equal to inventory items dot size, then we want to set selected item equal to zero, and we'll begin at the beginning of the list again instead. So this code should allow us to actually navigate that list using, in my case, the W and S keys. So if we run that, then pressing W will move the list down. And if we go past the bottom of the list, it'll just wrap me around to the top here. So that works quite nicely. Now, let me get a few more items inside of this list so that we can see it work a little bit better and make sure everything's working. Now, because my add item method here just stacks all the items that I create, I'm just going to comment out this code. So we add every item individually just temporary, just for debugging purposes, and we will add a ton more items into the list up here. 
So if we run it now, we have a nice full list of items that we can navigate through. Now already I see a problem, and that's that my player can still move around in the background of our game, even when we don't want the player to. So to fix that, what we're going to have to do is create a getter for the active variable in the inventory. So we'll have an isActive function, we'll just add that to the bottom of the inventory. And inside of the player class, in the check attacks method, because we don't want the player to be able to attack while he's in the inventory, after we do all this cooldown code, that way we don't mess up any of the timing, we'll say if inventory.isActive, so if the inventory is showing, just return. We don't want the player to attack. And we want to do the same thing for get input, the player's movement. So if inventory.isActive is true, if we are showing the inventory, return because we don't want the player to be moving around in the background. Now if we run the game, we don't have that problem when we're in the inventory here, but when we're out of the inventory, we can still move around and everything. Okay, now let's get to some cosmetic touches of this inventory. We want the selected item to stand out a little bit more. So if i is 0, and we're on that center selected item, then let me just copy this text here. We're going to render the item name, but I want some arrows to be there just so that we know that it's a selected item. So I'm just going to append on some arrows. And I'm also going to make the color yellow instead. Else, if we aren't at that selected item, we're just going to do what we had before. I'll just leave it as the color white, and we'll go without these special little arrow things. So that should make it look a little bit nicer. And let me change this to yellow. So if we run the game now, the selected item is highlighted yellow, and it has the little arrows between it. All right, that looks a little bit better. Now let's display the image and the count of that currently selected item. So after the for loop, because now we just want to focus on the selected item, we'll actually store that selected item in item variable. So inventory items dot get the selected item at the index, and we will do g dot draw image. We'll draw the item dot get texture. The x position will be that inventory image x that I created a little while ago. Inventory image y position. You might have to tweak these values to make it work correctly for you. Inventory image width and the image height. And then finally, null at the end there. So this should display the item's image onto the screen here. And as you can see, it displays that image perfectly. And finally, we'll have to do the count. So we'll do text dot draw string, passing graphics g. The text is going to be our item dot get count. But because this is an integer, we just have to convert that to a string. So integer dot to string, and we'll put get count in the center of that. X position will be my inventory count x position and inventory count y. Yes, I do want this value to be centered, or rather the text to be centered. I'll just make it the color white for now, and then assets.font28 again. So now we are actually displaying the count of that item as well there. So perfect, we have a fully working list for our items here. Now before I forget, let's go back into this add item method, and we'll uncomment all of this. And the reason why we commented that for testing is because now if I run the game, my rock and wood are just combined together here. Whenever we called that add item method in the top, of our inventory constructor. So I'll just leave two of those again for testing. Actually, let's delete them completely. So if we run the inventory now, we have no items in it, of course. But if we, let's say, knock down a tree here, collect a piece of wood, then now we have wood in the inventory. And hopefully it'll work if we collect a couple of rocks here. There we go. Now we have wood and we have two rocks as well. So our inventory is actually functioning properly. That is very nice. So that's all we had to get done in today's tutorial. Have fun with this, play around with it, and I'll see you guys in the next episode.